There are so many voices in this country that are speaking up and active, people active in their communities, that I'm not talking about a fringe minority or a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the mainstream media. The media today represents a minority elite. These all have to be challenged, and many people are doing it. It's Michael Franti here. This is Amy Goodman with, with Rochester. Rochester Indie Media. Today we talk about miraculous advances in medicine as if everyone benefits from them, from what science is discovering. But what is happening down here on the ground, where all of us live, is that our health care, our, our fundamental existence is getting worse, and our health care particularly is being taken away. Today we talk about putting the economy back on track, as if everybody benefits from that. But down here on the ground, where all of us live, the economy was in pretty bad shape before we, came, we became aware of the Wall Street meltdown. The statistics show, us that, show that most of us actually lost ground during the supposed economic boom of the 90s and the early 2000s. And now, the financial meltdown, the credit crunch, massive foreclosures, job losses, increasing health care neglect, tell us that down here on the ground, where all of us are, the economy is even worse. And it's especially bad for women and children. Why is that? Why is that more and why is it that more and more of us were threatened with worse and worse living conditions? Even as medical knowledge is improving, even before the financial meltdown, it's because, and you won't hear this from either of the major political parties talking about this, the promise of America is changing. The financial meltdown is just the latest in a long line of tremors. For decades now, the, cor the corporate world and its supporters have been sneaking in a new social contract, and they're not telling us about it either. It used to be that public education could get you a decent job, and that a decent job could get you a decent standard of living, and that you could count on your kids having a better life than you did. That was the old social contract, and it's just about gone, shredded. But now that money is being drained out of public education, and I might say our children thrown away. And people who look for decent jobs find more and more of them are just gone, filled by either computer-controlled ro robots or low-wage workers overseas. It's getting to where only the lucky find decent jobs, and they, and even then, they aren't sure they're going to last for very long. The new social contract has no use for workers it can't exploit. Just ask the workers at General Motors, and Delphi, and Ford, and the airlines, and my public schools, and countless of others' employees all across this nation. That's why community convenings like these and a thousand others across this country are so important. We have a different vision about what the social contract should be, how to fulfill that promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in that Declaration of Independence. A citizens movement, and by that I just simply mean residents, that is building around the country in support of creating a single payer and universal health care and eliminating poverty needs your voices added to it. We are the only Western country that ties health care to corporations instead of the government. Our political, civic, and corporate leaders gain so much wealth 
cutting our wages and eliminating our jobs and our health care, that only that citizens residents movement can achieve the vision we see of a government sponsored health care for everyone, whether you have a job or you don't, whether you have a record or you don't, no matter what color you are or language you speak or culture or profession that you have. If you're a human being in this country, you're entitled to a quality of health care that is that of a human being. And that is what we're going to talk about tonight. Before I want to start explaining what can we do about this, I want to spend a little time explaining why we're having this earthquake. It is produced by two revolutions that are going on beneath the surface. In the structure of production that is the foundation of our entire economic system, one is the technological revolution. The steady advances in computer technology have brought labor-saving technology to the point where it is actually labor-replacing. The second revolution is an economic revolution that is actually created by the technological one. If we don't need workers like we used to, why should we care about what happens to them? And just as importantly, how do companies keep making money when the percentage of workers with good jobs keeps shrinking? Even Henry Ford understood that his Ford company would make more money early in the last century if he increased the wages of his workers so that they could buy his mass-produced cars. But for decades now, we've seen the opposite reaction. Companies keep laying off workers, cutting wages and benefits, outsourcing jobs to countries where human labor is cheaper, replacing people with machines and replacing the manufacturing that was once done in our country, now in those countries. They aren't making these choices because our country had a national discussion about how to preserve our values while dealing with the technological revolution. They're making these choices because we haven't had a national discussion. And they don't see any other options and any reason to clue us in. What's happening to workers and other people on the low end of the economic spectrum as a result of this economic revolution is bad enough. But look at what happened at the high end of the economic spectrum where the financiers play. We've seen huge increases in financial speculation as banks and other corporations hunted for new ways of increasing their profits. These financiers saw that there wasn't enough profit anymore in investing in real industrial production. The technological revolution saw to that. So that in the 1980s, they started creating speculative in instru investments and in instruments. It was all an attempt to increase profits, and we are scrambling to deal with the wreckage from that house of cards collapse. Simon Johnson, the former chief economist of the International Monetary Fund, which you know you don't have to hold on your purse there, <laughs> says in an article titled, but this is actually very significant, The Quiet Coup, in the current Atlantic, Atlantic magazine, that the finance industry has effect effectively captured our government. So why can't we solve this problem by just going back to a better regulation of the financial system? Because these two revolutions I spoke of, the economic one and the technological one, have permanently changed the foundation of our economy. Together, these two revolutions have created one worldwide economy where there is a global workforce of poor workers competing with labor-replacing technology everywhere. This has created a crisis of a global abundance, where the great mass of, of the world's people cannot afford to buy the global abundance being produced. And yet the global abundance being produced is for the first time in human history enough to give every person on the planet a decent life if it were distributed differently. The machines are being used to impoverish most of us when they could be used to give most of us better lives. So today is about exploring solutions to one of the many aspects of this earthquake, the tragic breakdown of our healthcare system. You know the statistics, you live them likely. We spend more of our health care than any other industrialized country. We get less health care for what we spend 
than most anybody else. Hospital rooms are closing. Doctors are giving up their practices. People lose their health insurance when they lose their jobs. People can't afford to buy health insurance. The horror stories are too numerous to mention. Everybody is talking about the need for change. So, you, so we might ask a question. What would it take to give everybody who lives in this country adequate health care? A single payer method of administering and paying the health bills or single, or what we know as a single payer universal health care. Some of us may ask, what is single payer? What would be it essentially, what would be the essential components of what a US single payer system would have? So we elevate the conversation among our, co our colleagues, friends, and neighbors. If we want this different America, we the people are going to have to fight for it. So my friends, I suggest to you, we need government intervention to take over the private resources of the key corporations and run them in the interests of the we many, or the many, in the public welfare, not for private gain. That is the only way to accept the benefits of these twin financial and technological revolutions. Use them to create a new social contract for the benefit of our people, not just a rich, powerful, and well-connected few. Members of the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign Network started holding truth commissions in 2006. We had put together maybe six or so um, in regional efforts and then on a national level. And from that point, once we partnered up with some of our allies, we were able to hold more than 100 across the nation. The truth commissions that were put together were informed by the truth commission process in South Africa. They functioned to break the silence about the misery forced on people by lack of adequate health care in particular and a lack of economic human rights in general. So in other words, housing issues or lack of appropriate job or job plan and adequate wage. It was clear to us that all of these plights are tied together. You can't intelligently discuss a lack of access to health care without discussing the impact of poverty the way that you were talking about. You can't discuss the impact of poverty without discussing the lack of affordable housing, the lack of adequate nutrition, the benefits to everyone of, of a free education, the need for a living wage. All of these things. So, you know, for, for some of our, our colleagues that say, well, you know, we're going to get you the housing, but we still ain't got no dope. Okay, we're going to get you, we're going to make sure you, your kids is in a good school. But check this out, I'm still dodging the bullets and trying to get the crackheads not to kill me between the, you know, the bus stop and getting to my house. You know, maybe you feel me on this, but you know what we understand is economic human rights. It takes all of that to live lives with dignity. You can discuss the impact, you can't discuss the impact of poverty and, without discussing the overall impact of including the access to adequate health care, and all these things were declared as fundamental human rights back in 1948 by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, proposed by the United Nations and friends, signed by the United States, along with a number of other countries, and I should say, though not ratified. Our National Truth Commissions focused on the denial of several human rights, housing, health care, food, free education, cultural development. Our Truth Commissions Truth Commission and our network zeroed in on a single human right, such as the right to universal health care. But others focused in on the right to what in the Truth Commission push, put on by the Michigan Welfare Rights Union in Detroit, Michigan. As you know, water is just one of several fundamental human rights, human needs rapidly being privatized around the world. In the United States, as we sit here, some 40,000 people in Highland Park, Michigan, have lost their right, their right to water services because they've been privatized. They've raised the price of the municipal water so that poor people can't afford them now. This is not some developing third world country. This is right here in the United States. So privatized water companies are shutting off water services and water system and where workers are being also laid off and losing their jobs. This is a nightmare. Most tears come, let me tell you, 
I'm not looking at just one neighborhood. If it could be just one neighborhood or one city, you know, we could say in a country of 300 million, well, you know, this is an aberration. But we got aberrations all over this country. The Truth Commissions give us a public space and a broad platform to inject the victims of poverty into the fierce battle that is underway to forge a new social contract. They let us explain the controlling issues. From budget battles to hospital closures, the United States is one of the most, more intense, one of the more intense arenas fighting for this new social contract agenda. And showing how the destruction of the old social of the old social contract benefits the rich and elite of the globe. Our truth commissions functioned on several levels to help break this silence on the amount of human suffering these violations of human rights are producing. First, as a gra at the grassroots level, they encourage people to think about the various health crises in human rights terms. <clears throat> I am a human being, and I have a right to be, to have better health care than I'm getting. The United Nations at least says that these are rights and a lot of other countries, a lot poorer than ours, produce them. That thinking helps people to break out of the trap of thinking that it's their fault that they are sick, their fault that they couldn't get over, time, get, get over a lifetime of poor food, poor housing, industrial chemicals, mm -hmm. overwork, and a few beatings here and there to tip it all off. There's not much more, there's, there's, there's not much people can do if they think the problems that they are suffering are caused by some inadequacy in their character. There's a lot they can do once they recognize that the problems that they are suffering are shared by many others. And all the indications point to a flaw in the system rather than a personal flaw. That human being begins thinking also maybe it is more meaningful when we explain that the US, that our United States has the worst healthcare system in the industrialized world and it can afford to do better. Second, each person's testimony sent the important message that I don't have to suffer in silence. Now, this is not just my problem. My suffering is shared by lots of other people like me. This kind of sharing makes people stronger and when possibly more determined in seeking that vision. Third, in each truth commission, hearing creates an event that some U.S. news and outlets found no newsworthy. These news coverage, sometimes this news coverage is in print, radio, television, and it spreads the participants' stories far beyond the rooms that we might convene in. Fourth, each Truth Commission hearing had an impact on public policy. Elected officials lend a variety of kind of support. Other advocacy groups, such as labor unions and community organizations, lent their support. The, the stories people told were used in a variety of ways by these supporting actors as they pushed their own agendas for change. In the public policy arena in the United States, overall statistics about the size and depth of the healthcare crisis are crucially important, but they are no substitute for the outrage generated when someone develops the courage to stand up and say, this terrible thing has happened to me, and it shouldn't have. It didn't have to happen, and we have the power to see that it doesn't happen to any damn body else. Fifth, each Truth Commission lets us put the issues we are dealing with into our own context. We were able to highlight the reality of the destruction of that old social contract that was based on the industrial motive for, of the disappearing, that is disappearing from our country. We were able to talk about the way, about the way what little is left of the most destroyed social safety net was still being threatened. And they say, what? We've got, everybody's got tight and bell. It's got cut and pull some more. Because, you know, we can't, we can't make the, the yachts can't go. The, 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 another mansion got to stand. I mean, y'all just going to have to give up a coat or two. Or, and grandma just going to have to be out on the streets. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know? Of course, they never say it quite that way. But isn't it the reality? 
What happens when you don't have the income? Does your, does your landlord come and say, my God, I understand that your rent's been cut, so we're going to give you a break on that rent. Oh, and when you go to the grocery, I'm sure they say, oh, my goodness, your, your supplemental income's been reduced. We're going to reduce your, your, uh, your food subsidy by that amount, and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll honor it. I'm sure they do that out here in the great state of New York, but they sure don't do that in the state of California. <laughs> Sometimes we feel like if we let the anger out, the anger is going to be so big and so bad, it won't ever stop. It's kind of like when the tears start, when the people we love and the people we know went way too soon. We got a lot of anger. Because I'm a product of capitalism in America, a black woman who is struggling. I'll tell you, I got a lot of anger. But see, sometimes we try to bottle that up too much, and we stop. We remove the critical thinking. We got to put the anger and the critical thinking together. And then we got to understand we're the ones that can save and in fact direct the future of this country. And as long as we shut up, put up, and lay down, it's going to stay this way. It's time for us to wake up, baby. It's time for us to get busy. These fools in Congress can't do it. They bought off too much money. I'm sorry, but that's the deal. And it don't matter the newest one to the oldest ones. Too much money. Ask them when if they wondered could they make their mortgage payment. Ask them when if they wondered if they could pay their rent. Ask them how many relatives they had to put up to keep them from being outdoors. Check and see. Only trust the ones that have an answer that says, I know one. I've done this. All the rest of them jokers, hide your purse. <laughs> <laughs> Two other things the truth commissions allow us to do. In preparing our testifiers, we, can, we make sure that some testify and talk about solutions that uplift all the people. You know, a lot of people like to sell, sell some yellow goods. Well, the immigrants are the ones that got our jobs. Yeah. The immigrants are the ones that yeah. fill up the emergency room. Yeah. The immigrants are the ones that got A, B, and C. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. It's a lie. <laughs> Let's talk about men and women who have been relocated and have to come back to this country because they've been forced out of their own. They've been manufactured out or they've been relocated out by tyrannies that have driven them from their own homes. Let's talk about the reality that we got people who calculate that into their business plan to utilize unauthorized, unauthorized migrant workers. What about the notion if we brought the, the, the wage floor up for everybody regardless of nationality and rock that boat so the business couldn't use one against the other? That's what I'm talking about. We got to think about solutions that are not about who, which business benefits, but rather which human beings thrive. We try to anticipate ways at these truth commissions in California that we might be hit one against the other, and then we do a bit of manipulation. We make sure that for every sour or wrong seed that gets put in about is that group, the welfare moms, the immigrants, that this group, them felons, lock up more of the children. Can you make a jail for 10-year-olds? I think we have them now in America. Yeah. We got more people incarcerated than any other country on the planet. OK? Those are not solutions. I understand that they are reactions, but they are not solutions. So we got to talk about, and we try to do a manipulation when, in our hearings, what the solutions might look like. We try to anticipate these things, and we put in big picture and, just, and strategic thinking about the strategic importance of ending poverty as a part of promoting our economic human rights. Now, some people like to talk about that managing poverty stuff, and I'll tell you, I usually like to invite them to live on that. We also urge testifiers to talk about their visions for the future. Working people, poor people aren't often invited to dream as a people. And we, we, we think we're doing enough when we talk about our children, our single individuals dreaming. But, but I can remember a time when our neighborhoods had, were thriving. I can remember when we as a people had a vision, not only of equality and freedom, but of a life that was full of some happiness and joy. It wasn't just about one. Those times we talk about the Sister Sue used to look after this one and that one, had a vision of a people. I submit to you that vision 
along with strategy, are crucial. We think it's important to focus on a vision that makes it clear we don't have to set, settle for the limited and painful lives that poverty permits. Our starting point is as a global citizens. I want you to remember that, because that's a very controversial kind of thinking. But that's where the world is, baby. <laughs> we are global citizens. And people are going to try and tell us, we'll take care of our 300 million. Mm. Now, then they'll tell you, well, we're going to take care of some of the 300 million. And I'm sorry, but you're not in that club. And I'm already clear, I'm not in that club. <laughs> but, but I think that that's a wrong way, a wrong approach to solving problems. Our starting point is as global citizens with an appreciation for the particular history, culture, experiences, and expectations that are North American. We tap into that age-old longing for life, liberty, and the pursuit of freedom as our birthright. We advance a vision of America where there is good health care for everyone, where everyone enjoys the most basic economic human rights, and America free from addiction, homelessness, hunger, joblessness, violence, and poverty. We rally, march, demonstrate, protest, raise all kind of hell in every peaceable manner to give the justice and attention to these issues we need. We will not rest until that vision is won, and you need to expand and include these issues because the bigger is bigger than any of our individual or single struggles. This movement, this need for a broad social movement, Dr. King left on our hearts. There's some in this room who remember, and if some of you study history, you know he understood it. He grew from a civil rights activist to a human rights warrior. And in that process, he processed that you cannot talk about victory until you have vanquished poverty. So we are dedicated to a vision of health care and economic security for all of us. We believe we can build this relationship across color lines and across cultural lines. It's time to get busy. I love you and I thank you for your time.